Well, we are going to read from God's Word, from the very familiar passage of Exodus chapter 20, and we will read just the verses 8 through to 11, verses to do with the fourth commandment. And so here it comes, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's word. I will not read the Lord's Day 38 of the Heidelberg Catechism, because I will refer to it and quote parts of it uh, through this sermon. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, about 50 years ago, there was a Dutchman by the name of Adrianus van Selens. He wrote a booklet in which he said that on average, 10,000 families in the Netherlands alone were affected by serious quarreling about what was and what was not allowed on Sundays. Well, that figure amounts to about half a million quarrels per year. Now, although the duchies of 50 years ago were not exactly English Puritans, they would certainly relate to the Sunday program of the Puritan pastor, Richard Baxter. You see, according to Richard Baxter, this is what one must do on Sundays. Get up early, pray in private, then have family devotions, then go to the morning church and do not sleep in the church. When you get home from morning church, while lunch is prepared, pray in private and review everything said in church. Then over lunch, talk about the love of our Redeemer or something fitting for the Sunday. After lunch, gather as a family for a psalm or for singing and instruction. Then go to church once more. Then come home and gather together as a family to pray and sing and to rehearse the sermon. Then eat, but not too much, just as at lunch. Then after the evening meal, question the children and the servant about what they had learned during the day. Then sing a psalm and conclude with prayer and end the day with holy thoughts. <laughs> wow. Now, I don't want to question the pure heart that designed this Sunday program. But here are two things that may be wrong with such a program. Firstly, there, these are human-made prescriptive rules which should not be forced onto every believer, old and young, big or small. Secondly, it might well be that this program overloaded the Sunday with so many spiritual obligations that there was no time left for what the Sunday or the Sabbath was given for in the first place. And that is for rest, also 
physical rest. In this regard, we must remember our Lord's words to the Pharisees who turned the Lord's day into rules of do's and don'ts. But our Lord once said, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mark 2, verse 27. Yes, Sunday, or the Sabbath, is the Lord's day. But in God's grace, he has given it to man for man's well-being, spiritual and physical well-being. So Sunday was meant to be a day of joy. So why do we say that? Well, several passages through the Bible give us at, at least three reasons why Sunday should be a day of joy, which brings us to the first point in the sermon. Three reasons for joy. Firstly, rest. Exodus 20 reveals why the Lord's Day should be a day of joy. On it, you and I, by the highest authority in the universe, have been given the day of work. Why so? Well, it says that just as God rested from his work, Genesis 2, verse 2 to 3, Yes, just as God was, as Exodus 31, verse 17 says, refreshed, literally, just as God took a breath, so he commands mankind to rest on the Sabbath because of Christ. This has now become the Sunday. And so this is a command. And, and one would say, what a gracious command. What a gracious gift to mankind. You see, on this day, whether you are a workaholic or not, whether you're an employer or an employee, you all become equal. For God says that on this day, for your own sake, you must rest. By order of God, take the day off. Sadly, many rat-raced people do not do this. No wonder there are marriage breakups and family breakups and pain and suffering. My brother and sister, imagine how 200 years ago in the USA, the African slaves in the cotton fields enjoy this God-given ruling. Imagine how they just couldn't wait for Sunday when their boss, their work chaser, their slave driver was, by God's order, not allowed to drive them. And, and I too have similar memories from my military days uh, when I did my military conscription. The week was full on, and you were looking forward to the Sunday rest in many ways, physical, and of course, of course, I drank in the spiritual food on Sunday. No wonder the Heidelberg Catechism's Lord's Day 38 calls Sunday a festive day of rest, a festive day of rest, a day to rejoice because you have a break. Thus, according to Exodus 20, the first desire of God for you and me regarding the Sunday is a simple one. Do not work, and that is the first reason why Sunday is a day of joy. But what's the second reason why it is a, a day of joy? Well, because of freedom. 
The second desire of God for us regarding the Sunday is given in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Yes, Deuteronomy 5 verse 15 says God's people should keep the Sabbath in joy because they were freed from slavery in Egypt. My brother and sister, if the Sabbath was a joyful reminder to ancient Israel that they were freed from slavery in Egypt, then you and I and all New Covenant believers have a far greater reason for joy. You see, in Jesus Christ, the Sabbath, which was like a mere shadow, has been replaced by the real image. Children, all of us have seen shadows, haven't we? When you look at someone's shadow, for example, of a person, the shadow on the ground, or the person's shadow against the wall, and you do not see the person yet, you only see, of course, the outline of that person's body with lots of black on the inside of the shadow. You don't see any finer features. Yet, when you, your eyes are turned away from the shadow and you turn to see the real person, whose shadow that is, then you see the real thing. You see the style and the color of this person's hair. You see the color of his or her skin and eyes. You see the real size of the person. And that's exactly what Colossians 2 verse 17 says about the Sabbath of the Old Covenant. The Sabbath with its joyous reminder of Israel's freedom from slavery. That Sabbath was but a shadow of what was to come. But that Sunday morning when our Lord Jesus rose from the dead, that morning believers' freedom from slavery in Egypt was overtaken by a superior freedom. You see, what else was that first resurrection Sunday but proof that our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, was successful, that he who was slain for us had indeed worked our freedom from sin. He proved that by his resurrection. And so we are free. My brother and sister and dear children, on that first resurrection Sunday, the Sabbath, that was the shadow of being freed from Egypt that had passed away. The Old Testament Sabbath was replaced by the real thing, by the Sunday. The Sunday, which is the reminder that we have been freed from slavery to Satan, to sin and death. So just as circumcision as covenant sign of the old covenant was replaced by baptism, the new covenant sign. So thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ was Sabbath as an old covenant sign replaced by the Sunday. Christ is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. So rejoice, new Israel, be happy, new covenant believer. Remember and take it in. You are no more slave to Satan, to sin and the guilt of sin. Yes, every one of us, and I pray that all of us who by grace through faith has received Jesus right here in his or her heart, every such one can be sure that he or she is right with God. And here is the point. Whereas the first reason for Sunday joy 
was the fact that we don't have to work. The second reason for Sunday joy is that Sunday's rest and peace is a reminder of your and my freedom, which we now have from the guilt and punishment of sin. And so that was the second reason for joy. So here we come to the third and last reason for joy, and that is our future rest. You see, the third reason why God wanted you and me to be joyful on the Sunday is given in Hebrews chapter 4. That is that every Sunday rest reminds the believer, reminds you and me of the everlasting rest you and I will have in heaven, of the fellowship you and I will have with God. You see, Hebrews 4 makes it plain that the rest which God gave to the Old Testament believers when they entered the promised land that rest was nothing compared to the rest that was still to come. The rest for you and me. The rest which is heaven. Yes, instead of the rest brought by Joshua, there is the rest brought by Yeshua, by Jesus. The heavenly rest. Is that not why Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, There remains then a Sabbath rest. There remains then an ultimate rest for the people of God. My brother and sister, here is the beauty. As we sit together in fellowship with God and one another on Sunday, and it would be lovely to see us doing that again here in this auditorium. As we sit together in fellowship with God, to every onlooker from the outside or the inside, this fellowship is a vivid reminder. It sends a message to them and to us of the eternal fellowship which all believers will have with God and with one another. Have you ever thought of it? That our Sunday getting together, our Sunday fellowship here in this church is actually preaching a message, is actually evangelism in action. Because when people see us worship together, they are reminded, they are reminded of God and of what will happen one day. So just to recap, to recap point one, Sunday is a day which God in his grace has given for man's threefold rejoicing. Joy in rest from work, joy that we have been freed from the devil and sin and sin's guilt, and joy as we look forward to the eternal rest and fellowship that we will have with God. It's clear, isn't it? Although Sunday is the Lord's day, by God's, God's grace, it's also man's day. For man is absolutely blessed by what God has given us with Sunday, Sunday rest and Sunday worship. Yes, it is the Lord's day because it is a sign of God's covenant with you and me so that we will know that he is the one who has made us holy. But it is also man's day because of all the blessings we get and we are reminded of. So we should never and our Lord Jesus was clear on this. We should never reduce this day to a list of merely outward do's and don'ts. Now, because today's secularized world is putting the pressure on many a Christian to do Sunday work, 
the Christian may well ask, but, but which jobs are allowed? Which jobs are allowed on Sunday? And that brings us to point two of the sermon. Which jobs are allowed? My brother and sister, Reformed theology and reformers based upon the Bible have always said that followers of Christ who are in the following jobs or professions are allowed to perform their work on Sundays. So Christians in work of necessity, Christians in work of mercy, and Christians in work of religion. So what are these categories? Well, workers of necessity are, for example, police, fire officers, farmers who must give their animals basic food and drink, or rescuing their crop, which would otherwise have been destroyed by bad weather. So these are workers of necessity. Workers of mercy are, for example, doctors and nurses, ambulance staff, yes, medical staff that have to work on a Sunday. You know, some Christian medical workers have a choice, so it is between them and God how their conscience will lead and guide them. So that's workers of mercy, but the last one was workers of religion, and that is, for example, pastors, evangelists, pastors who have some of their busiest days on the Sunday. Now, my brother and sister, it would have been a whole lot easier, of course, if we have lived 50 years ago. When I was a child, when I was in my mid-teens, when even secular governments like the government we had in South Africa, and I'm pretty sure also in New Zealand and Australia, and I know it was the same in Germany, in Western countries, we had good Sunday laws then. But in our day and age, with the majority of citizens having no desire to keep the Lord's Day, some jobs, which 50 years ago were not works of necessity, may now have been forced to have become works of necessity. For example, certain public transport. Yes, public transport on a Sunday, buses or trains or planes, they may be restricted to fewer uh, trains, buses and planes, but these cannot really be halted, it seems, by our busy, busy modern people. Also, with grocery stores now open seven days per week, the shipping of consumer and perishable goods require early arrival and uploading. And so in order to remain in business, some Christian truck drivers now find that they are compromised to work on a Sunday so that businesses can function as per normal come Monday morning. My brother and sister, there are also other circumstances that may, for a season, require of the Christian to work on Sundays. And I hope they will be limited. And we pray that the Christian employer and employee will each one, before a gracious and loving God, yet a God of justice, decide for him or herself how to deal with Sunday work, how to scale down or how to pick your shift so that if ever you really have to work on Sundays, you will at least be able to attend the worship services. My brother and sister, much more can be said about Sunday works of necessity, mercy, and religion and how complex some of these have become in our secularized times. 
So let's rather ask another question, the following question on behalf of the majority of Christians who by God's grace have every Sunday totally free from work. And here is the question which brings us to the last point. Filling my Sunday. How do I fill my Sunday? How can I on Sundays fill the day with thanks and praise to my God? How can I thank my gracious Redeemer for the threefold reason of joy by which he blesses me every Sunday? Well, Lord's Day 38 gives good guidelines by, giving, by saying that on Sundays I regularly attend the gathering of God's people to learn what God's Word teaches, secondly, to participate in the sacraments, thirdly, to pray to God publicly, and fourthly, to bring Christian offerings for the poor. My brother and sister, although the Bible did not make it into a rule that there must be two worship services per Sunday, nevertheless, to worship two worship services per Sunday do give best opportunity for the thankful heart to put the emphasis and major focus on the day and on our awe-inspiring and gracious God. Some have asked, when does Sunday start and when does it finish? Does our day of rest, like the Jewish Sabbath, already start the night before at sunset? So does my Sunday keeping already start on Saturday night? Well, the Bible does not give that clear indication. But having said that, the way some believers spend their Saturday nights still have them weary and tired and far from God on the Sunday morning. Is the Christian author not right when he says the following about our preparation for Sunday worship? He says, many of us simply wake up and show up. We're sadly casual when it comes to meeting God. Now I know, meeting with, for example, the Prime Minister is not quite the same as meeting with God, who is much more personal to you and me than our Jacinda Ardern could ever be. Yet, that does not take away the fact that God deserves our respect much more than the Prime Minister. Yes, we may have a personal relationship with God. He sees everything and everywhere. He knows us when we're tired. He knows us when we are even uh, in the bathroom. He knows us everywhere. So there's a personal relationship between us and God. But that does not say that he does not deserve our respect. So let me ask you and myself the following question. Suppose you were granted a Sunday morning breakfast at the Beehive in Wellington. How would you and I then spend the Saturday night? Would you, as the Christian author says, get ready? Would you collect your thoughts of what you're going to say to the Prime Minister, to Jacinda? Would you think about your questions and requests? Of course you would. Should we prepare any less for an encounter with the Holy God? Well, why not pray before you come to church? Why not sleep before you come so you stay alert when you arrive and when you're inside the church? My brother and sister, <laughs> oh, that you and I and our children, all 
will come hungry to the worship service and that we will come willingly and keenly and that we will come expecting God to speak to us in this hour. Hebrews 4 reveals that as ancient Israel was still wandering in the desert, every Sabbath which they celebrated in that desert reminded them of the rest that is coming. The rest they would one day have once they entered their promised land. But hear what God said about those Israelites who did not trust that he would bring them into the promised land on his terms and for his glory. This is what God said about them. I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Wow. Hebrews 4 also reminds you and me that the same can still happen today. You see, as God had set a day for ancient Israel's entrance into their promised land, so says Hebrews 4 verse 7, God again set a certain day, calling it today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And so my brother and sister and and children and dear young person, my question is, have you received Jesus Christ in your heart? Or are you still like some of those Israelite, Israelites in the desert who have not received God and who would not see their Sabbath rest? So I pray that you have received the Lord Jesus Christ and that it will be seen in the way you and I in thankfulness to him fill our Sundays. Lord Day 38 says, and so, which means, and so, with a heart surrendered to God through Jesus Christ, begin for you and me already in this life our eternal Sabbath. Amen.